Let us pray. O Lord, we beseech thee favorably to hear the prayers of thy people, that we who are justly punished for our offenses may be mercifully delivered by thy goodness. For the glory of thy name, through Jesus Christ our Savior, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the Holy Ghost ever, one God, world without end. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated. We are in what's called the pre-Lenten weeks, three weeks that precede Ash Wednesday and season of Lent. The sermon is entitled, Pre-Lenten Training in Good Success. Pre-Lenten Training in Good Success. The book of Proverbs, it says this in chapter 13, verse 22, a good man leaveth an inheritance to his children's children, to his grandchildren. And the wealth of the sinner is laid up for the just. I get rather perturbed when I see a bumper sticker that says on, a, on the back side of an RV, um, I'm spending my children's inheritance. That is a very ungodly bumper sticker. Uh, because to be a good man, I should be thinking about my grandchildren. And uh, a good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children. And the wealth of the sinner is stored up for the just. Well, on Friday, my wife and I went to the funeral of this man here, if you can see him, David, An David Allen Huss. Dave Huss was a good friend of mine. Uh, God gave him 82 years of life on this earth. And uh, he left an inheritance that's incredible. Um, some that are here remember Dave. Uh, he's a wonderful demonstration of the goodness of God. All the readings today uh, in the scriptures that we have that are appointed for this Sunday... Uh, speak of God's goodness. Even the colic for today speaks of God's goodness. And Dave had a lot to be thankful for. Uh, first of all, let me just say that uh, when I first met Dave, I was an executive pastor of a, a very large church. And uh, we had a lot of uh, kids that started coming from one part of the valley and these were uh, rubble rouser kids. These were, um, they came out of the drug culture and they would show up on Wednesday nights. My brother-in-law, Kurt, was the youth pastor at the church and uh, he, he pastored everybody well, but this, it was an interesting mix. Uh, these kids were from uh, a different subculture, we would say. Um, and so uh, the senior pastor said to me in a pastor's meeting, Steve, you've planted churches before. How about if we plant a church in their neighborhood? Because these kids are coming. They're not mixing well with the kids we have here. <laughs> and and uh, I said, well, uh, why would I want to do that? I'm pretty busy as is, and I had my reasons. I said, however, I like the fact of uh, church planting. And so um, he said, well, just pray about it. Well, long story short, the Lord made it very clear to me that I was to plant the church so I said to the senior pastor, I will do this on one condition. I get Dave Huss. He's about 6'7". He's a big guy. He played college basketball in the Northeast. Uh, he and I would play basketball together. Um, I never could beat him. <laughs> He's, uh, he out-rebounded me, but a good friend. But I said, I want Dave Huss and his wife and his eight adopted children all from different countries. And a uh, senior pastor said, I, I don't know about giving up Dave. I said, you want me to do the church plant? I get Dave Huss because I need a solid rock, a very good elder because of the kind of uh, ministry we're going to develop there. Uh, and so uh, he said, we'll just call Dave. And I called Dave, and Dave in the conversation was saying, I'm there with you, Steve. Let's do it. And then the rest is history. Um, planted a church. Actually, James uh, used to bring his uh, Christian punk band 
on Wednesday nights. <laughs> for the, remember those days? Yeah. yeah. And uh, anyway, uh, some good musicians. And, and we had uh, a good church plant there. And uh, Dave was a, a fantastic uh, man of God in that setting. Um, Dave was a thankful man. He was a joyful man, and he understood the goodness of God. He came from a Plymouth Brethren background in uh, North Dakota, moved here to Phoenix, a totally different culture here. Uh, he would always tell me, nobody in our community up in North Dakota was divorced. He said, I came down here, and my goodness, even in the church, lots of divorces. And uh, so anyway, we had lots of conversations about things in our culture. But he was a thankful man, and he and his wife adopted eight wonderful children. They had 22 grandchildren. They have two, 22 grandchildren. Um, it was a joy to be there because some of them I, I hadn't seen, and Sue hadn't seen in a long time. So after the funeral, I mean, there was a lot of hugging going on, and, 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 and his kids, I, I pastored them, and uh, there was... a a real wonderful expression of the goodness of God. I took one of his kids on a mission trip to Eastern and Western Europe with a group of university students, and um, which was great. And then uh, Nate, uh, their youngest, um, was just, he was best friends with our youngest son, Seth, and was just starting to take an interest in the guitar. Uh, by the way, Nate, as time went on, uh, is a, a Nashville recording artist, a Christian artist, and uh, he wrote a song for his father and sang a few songs at at this at the wet, at the funeral, and it was uh, it was very touching, very touching because he sang it from his heart. And uh, interestingly, uh, the various ones that were there were pastors, um, church leaders, some that I used to uh, work alongside and congregate in a couple of these congregations. Um, and the, the minister that directed was my, my brother-in-law, Kurt, who still is at that church and uh, on Central Avenue and uh, did a great job with the funeral service. Also present at, uh, the, at the funeral were uh, teachers because uh, Dave taught at Phoenix Christian High School for years and had an influence uh, on various ones. In fact, our librarian here at the university, uh, Robert, told me he had eight classes with Dave Haas. And Dave made an impact on him in high school. Uh, also, various students of Dave uh, spoke at the funeral, and that was really wonderful. Uh, former Congressman Trent Franks was there because he was friends with, with Dave. Dave was a very solid uh, Republican, um, very conservative person. Um, and then uh, one of our judges in our, in our court system here, uh, Mike Herod, was there. And I haven't seen, Sue and I hadn't seen Mike in a while, so it was good to catch up with him. A lot of people from various, I mean, the church was, there's a lot of people there because a lot of people love Dave. It kind of reminded me of my father's funeral even when we left the church. The church was packed and we went to the same cemetery where Dave is buried, the, the national cemetery uh, where your husband is buried and uh, where my father and mother are buried uh, So for the, for the veterans. And uh, the uh, funeral director driving the hearse told me, look behind, and they had shut down Interstate, uh, Highway 51. They had shut it down, and he said, look at the traffic behind. He said, that goes, that goes a mile. Just people that were going to the graveside of my father. Well, Dave was like that also, an impact. These are, were godly men, my father and Dave. They were godly men, and they left, they left an inheritance for not just their children, but their grandchildren, and for a lot of people that they had mentored in the faith. And it was a joy to be, to be there. When Nate got up and, and, and sang about his father, I, I'm looking at Nate and I go, man, I remember teaching him, pastoring him, and I also uh, his one brother played uh, football one summer for a team in Brazil, and the name of the team was the Maccabeans. And so the, the, 
the Hus kids came to me and said, what's, what's that all about, the Maccabeans? They say it's in the Bible. Well, it's in the Roman Catholic Bible, the book of Maccabees. So I took, I took the boys through the uh, Maccabees in the Bible study, and, and uh, Nate was also very alert to things as a teenager. One funny story, and I reminded him of it. Um, because we had a lot of uh, ex-cons that came to our church, a lot of former drug addicts and people from the drug court system that came to our church, um, we also brought in uh, riffraff and interesting people. And I remember the first day that a, a trans person came in, a man dressed up like a woman and uh, prancing in to disrupt the service halfway through the service during my sermon. And he came and sat right up close to the front and then sat down and did everything, I'm not going to portray it, but acting like a woman. And, uh, well, I, had, I lost my train of thought a little bit as I was preaching, and I just kept going until that, that man, dressed up like a woman, looked at me and winked at me. At that moment, I lost my place in my sermon, and uh, I wasn't ready for that. But the thing is, he's the father of one of the girls in the church that hated her dad. And she had already told me why she hated her dad. Uh, we, so we had, we had some interesting people that would come to our church. But I remember the next Sunday, Nate came to me and he says, Pastor, was that a man or a woman? And it was interesting. I said, Nate, what do you think? So I said this to Nate, and Nate said, it was a man. I looked at his legs. Those are the legs of a man. I said, way to go. We high-fived each other. I said, but we need to pray for him. He needs Jesus. Big time. And his daughter, you know, he's, he needs to take responsibility for his daughter. Well, anyway, Nate s sang some songs about his father, and it was, it was fantastic. Um, the Puritan John Boy said, The saints of God are revealed inwardly with faith, but outwardly with good works. Good works flow from the justifying faith that we are saved. In Ecclesiastes 2.26, listen to what the words of the God are. For God giveth to a man that is good, God gives to a man that is good in his sight, wisdom and knowledge and joy. And I saw that in Dave Huss. Wisdom, knowledge, and joy. But the sinner he giveth travail to gather and to heap up that he may give to him that is good before God. And that's very similar to the proverb that I started with, the wealth of the sinner is laid up for the just, and that's in the context of a good man leaves an inheritance for his grandchildren. I thank God for Dave Huss. All of us celebrated that day a man of God, Dave's wife, Sylvia. Sylvia and Sue used to teach weekly Bible studies at our home and uh, for years. Uh, but Sylvia has dementia. And uh, so it took a little bit of time for Sylvia to remember Sue and I. And then this, she didn't remember Sue, didn't remember me. But when we stood together, then she remembered us because we're together. Because her and Dave had 56 years of marriage together. That's an inheritance. And the readings of Scripture today are talking about we need to reflect on these things that will, will be an inheritance of goodness that we can give and we can have good success if we pass that on to future generations. We plant churches for that reason, to go beyond just this generation, but to be uh, multi-generational. So we are in the pre-Lenten training in good success. Well, today is called, um, we're in what's called the Gesema Sundays. So this is Septuagesima, and I'll explain that shortly. Um, these are the three pre-Lenten weeks which serve as a time for spiritual preparation before Ash Wednesday and before we enter into the season of Lent. And we do that how do we do that? By enjoying the goodness of God. By enjoying the goodness of God. Remember last week, the epistle lesson ended. We looked at 
Romans 12 last week, and I actually did an exposition through the whole chapter last week. And, and you know, I did it, I think, in 35 minutes. That's kind of a record. The point, the point is that the last verse of Romans 12 was about don't, don't, it's talking about don't take vengeance. Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if, you're hun- hun- if your enemy hungers, feed him. If he thirsts, give him drink. But in so doing, you shall heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. We overcome evil with good. Uh, or as my father would always say, kill him with kindness. kindness. Right, you remember that. One of the little kids last week, uh, one of the parents was saying, so what, what, did, what did pastor say? And he says, yeah, well, what do you do with somebody that you, doesn't like you? Kill him. I said, well, wait, wait, there's a little bit more than what the pastor said. Kill him with, oh, yeah, kindness. Yeah, kill him with kindness. Okay, let's make sure we get the whole thing. We overcome evil with good. And um, so the, the preseason, preseason training, like, just like we have here in the Phoenix area, we have baseball spring training, preseason training. If you're a baseball fan, I know this Brother Mark is, um, then Phoenix is a place to come to. But we are doing preliminary preseason training to prepare us for Lent. And the focus today is that we want to do the training that is in goodness and godliness, that we look at um, temperance, but we do it in understanding that that's good for us. Well, we are... um, this colic that was given, uh, there's this phrase there, may, may God be mercifully, may mercifully deliver us by his goodness. Well, where did that come from? Well, it comes back, goes back to the 6th century. Uh, the Lombards entered Italy. And these were ruthless Germanic invaders who attempted to invade Rome. And John III responded to these invasions by calling the church to set aside the three Sundays before Lent as a time to implore or to entreat and to beg the Lord to mercifully deliver the Christians from their enemies because they were wiping out Christians by the terrorists of their day. Well, then on Septuagesima Sunday, which is today, the Christians in Rome gathered at the church of St. Lawrence where the people prayed the colic, which was appointed from the prayer book for us today, But that prayer actually goes back to the 6th century. O Lord, we beseech thee favorably to hear the prayers of thy people, that we who are justly punished for our offenses may be mercifully delivered by thy goodness. For the glory of thy name, through Jesus Christ, our Savior, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the Holy Ghost, ever one God, world without end. Amen. That prayer is very appropriate in light of the stuff that's going on even in our nation right now. This prayer, just remember that. That's a prayer... Uh, in the midst of things, uh, and many Christians are being persecuted. Uh, Peter Navarro right now has been put in shackles for his uh, Christian faith and being out, an outspoken person. Uh, and he didn't do anything wrong other than standing up for the truth. So they're going after certain people. So 700 years now of uh, jail time for uh, Trump, was it? Something like that they're trying to get him for. Like, so this prayer is very appropriate. But it's about the goodness of God. Because even in the midst when terrorists of the past or terrorists in the present seek to do evil, we need to pray and look to God to deliver us. Well, Septuagesima means it's the 70 days before Easter. Next week will be Sexagesima, 60 days before Easter. And then another Latin term, Quinqua Gesima. You'll see that on the bulletin next week, 50 days before Easter. This preseason of Lent is designed to condition us for the fasting season to which we are called to participate in during Lent. Basically, this time is to call us away from the festive seasons of Christmas and Epiphany, so to prepare or condition us for the discipline of fasting, humility, humility. Holiness and doing justice. And it is this preseason conditioning message on the virtues of, that God has given 
especially the good virtues, the goodness of temperance and justice that are found in the epistle and gospel readings for today. The value of these good virtues are expressed through the spiritual training of holiness that is the object of the season of Lent. Well, what about the Old Testament lesson for today? Joshua. Pre-Lenten training and good success was for him, even though they weren't celebrating Lent. They were being prepared after 40 years of Lent in the wilderness to go into the promised land. Their Easter was going to be the conquering of the land of Canaan. And that was a precursor of the greater deliverance that was going to come through Christ the Messiah, the greater Moses, and the greater Joshua. So we have Joshua's commanded by God to possess the land. Joshua already had faithfully served Moses during this 40-year wilderness wandering experience. And he served as one of the 12 spies that were sent out, according to Numbers chapter 13. The Jewish historian Josephus said that Joshua was 85 years of age when he succeeded Moses, and we see that in the text of Scripture. He then, Joshua, spent the next six years seizing the promised land. He didn't do it over, they didn't do it overnight. It took six years to conquer the land. And after the conquest, he continued to govern the 12 tribes of Israel for how long? 25 more years. And when did Joshua start this? At the age of 85. By the grace of God, that's what I want. I'm going to turn 70 this year, and um, I just lost my buddy, Dave. The Lord took him. He struggled with cancer, uh, but he made it to 82. But by the grace of God, you just go and you keep going. Because I'm not only raising up, we're not raising up, my wife and I, an inheritance for our grandchildren only, but for our great-grandchildren. We want to pass on a legacy to them. And this is the way that my father taught me, son, be a good man, raise up an inheritance for your children's children, your grandchildren. You've got to think down the line. And that's pretty good coming from a man that grew up on the south side of Chicago that was a street fighter and was mentored by my Uncle Bruno, who worked for Al Capone. But my dad became a Christian in his teenage years, and he learned how to walk and follow Jesus. He went in the Marines. They still were kind of scared of him because he's from Chicago. Anyway, my dad was a big guy. Um, anyway, how long did Joshua live after that? He lived to the age of 110 years. He lived a good life. A good life. And Dave Huss, all the friends and family members that were saying things at the funeral were saying pretty much, Dave lived the good life to the very end. He did because even with his wife, Sylvia, with dementia, Sue and I are talking to the daughters that we used to pastor, that I used to pastor, and they're caring for their mom, even though her mind is not either. However, her mind came together when she saw Sue and I together. Like, oh, I know you both. <laughs> like, that was, a, that was a godly moment. Because in spite of what she's struggling with, she remembered us together. Joshua lived the good life. In Joshua chapter 1, verse 6, Be strong and of good courage, for unto this people thou shalt divide an inheritance of the land, which I swear to their fathers to give to them. Verse 8, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate in a day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way, what? Prosperous. And then thou shalt have good success. That's the sermon title, pre-Lenten training in good success. Here's the point. Joshua was, in this passage, was told, have good courage and good success. And that's what we need as Christians today in our culture. We need good courage, not just courage, but we need the right type 
of courage. We don't need to be obnoxious in our culture, but we need to call sin, sin, and we should not back down from it. We should stand for the truth and not compromise. But that's good courage. And then we will have good success like Joshua did. Well, the epistle lesson, St. Paul, in terms of temperance, St. Paul uses an analogy of an athlete in training. And this is all, again, about pre-Lenten training in good success. In the text, we hear that as an athlete, you are to wish to receive the mastery, the prize. I've coached for years. If I'm coaching my players and I just say, well, hey, you know, we go into a game. Like, we're not going to win this game, by the way. Like, I, I just don't do that. Like, that's just not the way to coach. Even if I think, yeah, we're probably going to lose, except for the basketball team, the women's basketball team at the University of Lancaster in England, yeah, we were never going to lose. Like, that was, but in some teams I coached, it was like, okay, this is going to be a brutal game. Uh, but you don't go into a game situation assuming you're going to lose. And so St. Paul is saying this, you, you seek for the prize, for the mastery, for the trophy. But you have to be temperate in all things. And that's what we do during Lent, is we then abstain from certain things so that we may be disciplined. St. Paul was in training. As we enter this preseason of Lent, what do we need to be trained in? Well, what do you normally struggle with in sin in your own life? If you can't think of any area wherein we need training and self-control, all you have to do if you're married, ask your spouse. Uh, if you think, I've got it all together, and you come to me with that, and if I see something I think you need to work on, I'm going to do what I just said earlier. I'm going to have good courage, and I'm going to tell you, I think you need to work on such and such a thing because you're rather obnoxious to some people, you know, in the church. And, like, you need to work on that. You need to bring that to the foot of the cross of Jesus and deal with it. Now you're going to be afraid to talk to me. <laughs> but, but, but we do need to call one another, hold each other into account. And so St. Paul did this. And that's, that's a, a cardinal virtue, even in the ancient world, and that, that kind of uh, humility. So whatever we struggle with, the gospel lesson, lesson today is put, pushing our buttons. If you reacted to the story of the laborers in the vineyard, then there needs to be some training. Because if you're struggling with the fact that the, guy that owned, the guys that only worked for an hour, and they got the same amount of money as the guys that worked through the heat of the whole day. Maybe it was like Arizona heat in the summer. Like, well, why do they get the same amount as we? You know, if you find that you're struggling with that, like, that's not fair. Well, that's, yeah, that's not fair, but God's just. And did he not say that he's, a, he's, he's the good, out of the goodness of his grace, the landowner said, this is what we agree upon. So this is always management and labor. They always have conflict and things like that. But the bottom line is, if you struggled with that parable, as you heard uh, Father Mark read it today, um, that's a good sign that there's some things to work on, maybe in the area of envy. Ouch. Verse 15 of Matthew 20, Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me, or do you begrudge my generosity, is what the, Jesus said. So what point was Jesus making here? Well, it says that the, the ones that worked all day long started murmuring. And that was a sinful response, and Jesus dealt with it because they were, when someone else comes in as a latecomer, why are you getting upset if they're receiving grace and goodness, uh, as opposed to those who arrive first, because we tend to think that way. Now, that we could take this in a lot of different ways, because if you, you've been in a job situation, and you've been working there a long time, and then somebody gets elevated before you do, and you get ticked off, 
There, that's something you can work on during the season of Lent. I've been in those scenarios many times. And like, how come they, well, you know, you have to just like, <laughs> you have to learn to deal with that. And Jesus did in this parable. Again, let's reflect on Proverbs 13, 22. A good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children, and the wealth of the sinner is laid up for the just. So my question to all of us today is, what kind of inheritance will you leave to your family and friends when your body is in that casket? What will they say about you? And will people show up at your funeral. So what we do in this life is very important. The application of this from a great Anglican vicar in the 1800s in the Church of England, Charles Bridges said this, and if there is no earthly substance to leave, he's talking about leaving an inheritance. If you don't have the financial, if you don't have land, property, a lot of money in the bank or whatever, if, if you don't have any earthly substance to leave, yet a church in your house, that's something you could leave. You, you gather the people of God together in your house, you show hospitality, you plant a church, like what Jonah and Megan do out in Maricopa. And yet they're here this evening. You were at our house yesterday. And you still like us? Okay, But you have a church in your home, a, a new church plant, right? A mission. So that's one inheritance because you are looking with hope and goodness that eventually a church will emerge and bring blessing to that community. Is that not true? Then he goes on to say, a family altar. So you don't plant a church in your house, but you have a family altar. After a meal, you sit down, as Dave and Sylvia Huss did. I was in their home lots of times, and as my wife and I do. And you, you open up the scriptures and you read the scriptures. You have a family altar. You pray together. You use the prayer book. He goes on to say, the record of holy example and instruction. These are things that we can leave. And above all, a store of believing prayer laid up for accomplishment. When we shall be silent in the grave, all of these things, when we're silent in the grave, will be an inheritance to our children of inestimable value. Take to heart what I shared about my friend Dave and the inheritance that he left his family as an example to us. Because I was, my, my wife was, we were encouraged. And the people, our friends that were there, we were encouraged together with the inheritance. And interesting, the pastor that did the whole service is my brother-in-law, and I, he, I let him marry my sister. And I officiated their wedding many years ago and he's been the longest standing pastor in that church that I used to pastor in. And he's still there. He's outdone even the senior pastor who's retired. And I mentored him in the faith, in the ministry. And he's still going strong. And I looked at my brother-in-law and said, and boy, I know a lot of his flaws, and he knows a lot of my flaws, but I'm going, thank God. Here's a rock in the church, and he's overseeing and presiding over him our friend Dave's funeral. Those are the things in life that matter. Those are the things that we do to store up an inheritance and to have good success. So as we enter this preseason training before Lent, let us see that, it's, that what God has in store is that when we go into Lent, that's the discipline to bring us even greater success. Good courage and good success. Amen.